I travel over 100,000 miles a year in my job. I travel domestically and abroad. And one thing you learn with that experience is you have to be prepared when you have type 1 diabetes. You have to sort of think forward a little bit and decide what would be problems you may have. For example, you might not always get to food when you need to have it. Or you might not be able to take insulin conveniently when they're serving food. So you have to think those things through a little bit. There's a few things you need to prepare if you're going to travel if you have type 1 diabetes. First, you need your insulin, and you need to have backup for your insulin. You need enough insulin to carry you not only for the trip, but in case there's an unanticipated delay. When I'm traveling, I usually figure how many days I'm going to be gone. I figure out how much insulin I'll need for those days, and then I at least double it, if not triple it. You never know when something's going to happen. The plane doesn't take off, right? If you have type 2 diabetes, the same rule applies to you. You need to take your oral medications to control your diabetes, not only for the time that you're going to be gone, but have backup in case you don't get home on time. Second, you need a way to assess your glucose. You need to check your control and know what your control is. That means you carry a meter and enough strips to carry you. Third, you need a way to correct a hypoglycemic reaction, a low blood sugar. That could either be a form of rapid acting you know, carbohydrate or something to eat, but make sure you have it. Fourth, you need to have a form of identification. In case you get into trouble where you can't help yourself, you need the help of somebody else and they need to know that you have diabetes. When I'm taking a long plane flight where there's gonna be meal service, there's three things I want on my person. I don't want them overhead where I may not be able to get to them because of a turbulence or something in the aisle. I don't want them under the plane. I want my glucose tabs with me in case I get low. I want my insulin with me so I can take it for the meal. And I want to have a meter with me so I can adjust and determine what dose to take. When you start traveling over large time zones, for example, if you're going over to Europe or Asia or someplace where the time really shifts a lot, you need to think a little bit about your diabetes and how your insulin works in terms of the timing of your insulin. So if your insulin is good for four to six hours, but you change a time zone, you need to account for that. When you're thinking about traveling for pleasure, taking a vacation, sometimes you can really incorporate a lot of things into that vacation that are really good, sound practices for diabetes. You can take vacations that have physical activity built into them. Go to national parks, take hikes, go out into the wilderness a little bit and use your feet, you know, not a bad idea. Sometimes you can go to places where there's uh, pools and ocean and, and the options for swimming or using a bicycle. It's not a bad idea to incorporate good diabetes care into having fun and into vacation. When you're driving in your car, okay, a couple of good rules. First, don't put your insulin in the glove box, leave it there and forget. Because if the car gets too hot or gets too cold, you ruin your insulin. Now you have nothing to work with, and that's a big problem. Number two, make sure you have something to help you correct hypoglycemia. If you get low, that means you need to have something that's rapid and will correct it. And you shouldn't drive while you do that. You should pull over, correct it, and that brings us to the third rule, have a meter. You don't know what's going on unless you can check. So you need to find out when you're safe to drive. If you have diabetes and you haven't traveled a lot yet, you can get excellent advice from your healthcare team. They can give you good sound tips about how to travel safely with diabetes. My job requires that I travel quite a bit. I do about 100,000 miles a year. It's tempting sometimes on the road to sort of decide that the rules at home that we all follow with good diabetes practice don't really apply anymore. You start eating things that you normally wouldn't eat at home and you eat them in quantities that you wouldn't normally eat. When I go on the road a lot and I go to business meetings, I don't always have a lot of choice over what I get served and the foods that are put in front of me. That requires that you make some decisions about what you want to eat, how much you want to eat, whether you want to choose one item over another. One thing I like to do is take a little bit of time to carefully read the menu. I don't look at the first choice and say, okay, give me this. I actually try to look and see other decisions and choices I can make that will help me reduce the amount of calories I'm eating and eat foods that have less of a bang on my glucose. You may ask for things to be prepared differently. You may ask them to have something. You may ask them to make substitutions. When I go to restaurants that I'm not familiar with, is I'll ask for a to-go box and have them divide my meal before they bring it out. That way I can look at what I get, decide whether it's enough for me to eat, and I usually have a snack for later on when I need it. It's important when you're on the road to maintain some good physical activity. 
Most hotels have a gymnasium or some place that you can do exercise. Other times you can just decide to walk or take advantage of, of, of the place you're at to take a look around. Like all of us, my desire is to have my diabetes the best possible control. And that extends to when I'm on the road in a situation sometimes is a little bit more challenging. I want to do it for all the reasons that all of us want to do it. I want the best possible health. Telemedicine is more than one thing, which most people don't really recognize. Telemedicine is both synchronous, which means you're talking to the patient in real time. It's asynchronous, which is the work that you do behind the scenes before you actually communicate with the patient and then afterward. And then it's also remote monitoring. And all of those three pieces are incredibly important in the management of people with diabetes when it comes to telemedicine. I work in two parts of town. One part of town is in Beverly Hills where patients have access to all the health care that they need. But in East Los Angeles, it's an underserved population. There are real barriers to trying to deal with underserved individuals with telemedicine where they don't have access to health care, they have lower incomes, they have often lower educational levels, they're often challenged by lower health literacy, lower numeracy skills. They have a hard time even getting to clinic visits. They often have to take two and three buses. They generally don't have smartphones. They don't have computers at home. Most of them have some form of a telephone, but their access to those can be erratic. I have literally 20 and 30 year olds who have amputations, who go blind, who are on dialysis, who have all of the complications of diabetes young, all because of access issues. But I became really convinced that the best way to reach our patients was through telemedicine, or at least for some portion of their visits, because if you do telemedicine at the right time, which would probably be the evenings or maybe early morning or the weekends, that we could reach a whole lot of patients, but the whole system would have to change in terms of the staffing when we do what we do so that we can reach people more effectively. In terms of remote monitoring and the acquisition of data, having devices that talk to the cloud and give you data is the answer. If we can't get data, we can't manage our patients. So a lot of them in the beginning were trying to tell us the data from their meter memories. And a lot of them couldn't really figure that out and it was hard for them to do. There are continuous glucose monitors that do that seamlessly. And there are glucose meters that also do that. Our county patients by and large don't have those devices. But one of the things that we did really early on was we were able to get grant funding and we started being able to give devices, continuous monitors to our patients who were on insulin. And then we set up a system whereby we could get data into the clinic. What happened after that was that because we now had data, we became able to get the patient's um, health insurance, which primarily was Medi-Cal or Medicaid and other places, to allow us to actually get the devices for patients through their health plans. And so increasingly, we be began to be able to do remote monitoring and get data. If in the old days, a patient had their blood sugars go up and they needed help, they could call and then someone might get back to them and it was a pain. And then maybe they'd come in for clinic, but it was two weeks later. Now they can call, we can have our assistant get all the data that day and then send it to us. And I can get data on a patient that I can then look at. And then I can give information back to the patient about what to do to help manage their diabetes. So it allows for a quicker turnaround that allows for patients to do better. And it's much easier than a patient going to the walk-in clinic or to the ER because we can manage a lot remotely that we couldn't manage before because we've developed systems. Now, again, these are baby systems. This is the beginning of systems development, but I can see what's possible and I couldn't before. Telemedicine can help me keep patients out of the hospital for ketoacidosis because I'm able to, in a very immediate way, talk to patients several times a day if necessary, have them give insulin, drink fluids, ingest carbohydrates, do whatever I need to do 
to keep them safe at home. But that requires something that I call my diabetes ICU. And what I do is I take patients who I think are sick. So they're either new onset patients or patients whose diabetes has gone wildly out of control or patients who've developed COVID, whatever it is, they're patients I'm worried about. I have my patients in my ICU on a specific frequency. And so some of my ICU patients may need me to monitor them a couple times a day. Some patients need daily monitoring and some patients need weekly monitoring. And I have my diabetes educator, whatever the frequency is, to send me the data. So they look in the cloud, they get me the CGM tracings or whatever they have or need. They send it to me and then I make treatment decisions. And so it's in real time, just like if I had the patient with me in a bed in my house and I take care of them and I then prevent them from going into the hospital but I also help them control their diabetes better, but it's very high maintenance. It requires that I'm available 24 seven and I can't scale it if it's just me and a diabetes educator because I can't do this to thousands of people. I think we need to do a lot of research to develop these systems of remote monitoring and feedback to patients because if we can do it in near real time and adjust intensify, use it to pick up patients who are falling out of the system, we can really help bring them back. And I think it might make people feel safer. It might make them have less diabetes distress. If you knew somebody was always looking out for you, wouldn't you feel better? And if you knew you could just reach out and call somebody and talk to somebody who could discuss things with you and help you, diabetes isn't just about blood sugar. It's about all the factors that go into raising that blood sugar and making people feel safe and making people feel not judged and making people feel that success is possible. My advice to practitioners is that telemedicine's a great tool as long as you have the resources to prepare for diabetes management, which means getting the data in advance and having it available to access to help patients and then having some follow-up so patients can follow your advice. But the second thing is, is telemedicine alone is not enough. Because I've started going back into the office on the west side where I was strictly doing telemedicine. And I've seen people come in who had foot ulcers that they didn't really complain to me about on the phone because they couldn't really see their feet. And I've seen patients where their medications were mixed up, where they couldn't figure out how to download their meters so I couldn't get the data. And so I think that there's got to be a hybrid model. The key to all of this is having a team. Diabetes management has always been about educators and dietitians and social workers and psychologists and ophthalmologists and everybody else. It does take a team. There's no one size fits all and every community has its own solutions. But I think we as physicians and researchers need to figure out what would work for a community and help them achieve that. And I think we can do a wonderful job. I think we can really change people's lives, but in some ways it's one situation at a time. And I think people should always be optimistic that we can help. And I've certainly seen ups and downs and funding come and go, but we really need to believe in the process.